So with me on today's show is Jeffrey Shaw from Manhattan in New York. Jeffrey has been a creative entrepreneur for more than 30 years as the go-to portrait photographer for an exclusive clientele, and he has a deep understanding of the unique challenges faced by people who are building non-traditional businesses in a world based on a traditional business model. As a business coach and speaker, he supports creative entrepreneurs to use their strengths as creatives and how to get clear on who they are and how they can best serve and build a successful business doing what they're meant to do. As a photographer, his portraits have appeared on The Oprah Show, CBS News, in O Magazine, People Magazine, and New York Family Magazine. So, hi, Jeffrey. I am really thrilled to have you here with us today, and I'm really looking forward to chatting with you about the role of creative passion in running a successful business. Oh, well, thank you, Nigel, and I, I thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here and excited about those to- talk about those topics as well. Yeah, it's something that we actually don't get to talk about all that often on this podcast, so I'm really keen to get into that. But Before we do, can you give us a quick sort of potted history, if you like, of how you got interested in the professional side of creativity to begin with? Sure, absolutely. Um, So like many, you know, it was something I dabbled in photography as a kid. Uh, Honestly, for me, as a particularly a really shy teenager, it was a way I could be reclusive, uh, you know, the dark room and all that in in those days. Uh, So it was kind of the perfect choice for a hobby for somebody that was really reclusive and afraid of people. So and I know that doesn't show up in, in the way I present myself today, but it is true of my past. We had a dark room in my home and and played with it. And it, it evolved. I eventually went into uh, went to photography school, got out of there and, and immediately went into business. And I've now been uh, exclusively an on-location portrait photographer for more than 30 years. So about halfway through my career, I came across the idea of a business coach. Now, mind you, in 1999, business coach was not a common term. And I worked with my business coach three times a month for seven years, and which tells me I was either a, a basket case and needed a lot of work, or I just, as I, liked, <laughs> as I like to think, I just got a lot of value out of it. I loved the experience. And when he retired about seven years ago, uh, it inspired me to become a business coach and give back what I had gained from the experience. So today, my roles as photographer and, and business coach are about 50-50. Uh, in that, uh, in the course of a day, I'm kind of uh, playing both roles, roles in about equal amount. I noticed a quote. I, I was over on your Facebook page earlier today, and you had a great quote up there on the header graphic of your Facebook page that really caught my eye. And it says, "Clarity is the fearless union of conflicting ideas," and it's such a an interesting statement. And so, what I'd like to do is start off with kind of investigating how important is clarity in business and why do so few people seem to fully achieve that on a sort of a day-to-day basis? Thank you so much for noticing that. And actually, the reason you noticed it is exactly the reason one needs clarity. So in my coaching, I we refer to that statement as a, what's called a standout statement. And it is, uh, it's actually quite a journey to get to your standout statement uh, in that, and it's its part of my coaching process that is to help people to get to a deep understanding of why they do what they do, you know, the, the deep why, the purpose. And, and it's work to get there to take support. So we work hard at helping people get clear on why they do what they do, which is a journey that most creatives really enjoy. The result of that is what most creatives are lacking in their and to be successful in business. And that is what do you do with that? So the standout statement becomes a representation of the inner journey that you go on and delivering that message that says what you believe in in as few words as possible. That becomes the standout statement that the outer world, your prospective clients, see when they come to your website, your blog, your page, your social media, they get a glimpse as to what you believe and it compels them and, and draws them in. So a standout statement as a function is uh, both meant to magnetize your ideal client towards you and those that don't get it or think you know they just don't get it at all, they stay away. So the standout statement is the ultimate magnet and filter, which results in you working with your ideal clients. So it's an incredibly powerful thing. So I appreciate that you noticed it and you noticed it because you, you're intrigued by what it means, which is, I think, the root of your question as well. I use something similar called the essential message. And uh, this is something that I talk about with my coaching students, too, is getting to the core of why you do what you do. What's the ultimate benefit that people get from working with you as well? And how can you communicate the essence of that in, as you said, as few words as possible so that it's it's almost instant delivery to the important part of the brain that makes that connection? Absolutely. I love that. And so, and to your point, I mean, the, the we ask ourselves a lot of questions in the journey of 
to getting to our standout statement or the essential message. And we, it's a personal journey to get there. Along that journey, I suggest my clients ask themselves a lot of questions. And one of those questions is what keeps the people you want to serve, what keeps them up at night? And when I asked myself that question for those that I can serve and coach, what I felt kept them up at night was not knowing where they're going. You know, just that. And I, and of course, we always know these things because we've experienced them. You know, it's, it's just that lack of direction or for most creatives, it's going in a million directions and not being sure where to go, what to do next. So that confusion is what I believe holds them back. So clarity for me is what you need in every way, shape, and form. You need to be clear on what you stand for. You have to be clear on what direction you're going in. Then you have to be able to communicate that in a clear statement, your essential business message or your standout statement. You have to be able to communicate that in a clear way so the people that you most want to serve find you, understand what you're about, and come towards you. So to me, the common thread in the whole process of having a successful business is clarity. The clarity comes from resolving much of what appear to be complete opposites. And for us creatives in business, our world is full of opposites because most of the business world is based on a traditional business model, selling products, selling commodities, some services. But overall, the lessons of business are not based on what we need when we're in business marketing ourselves and our talent, which our needs, the way we need to be in business is very different. So by going into business, marketing yourself and your talent, you're automatically setting yourself up for a great deal of conflict. And nobody's pointing that out to us, uh, and I am, (laughs) so that we can resolve those conflicts so that you can get the clarity you need to be successful. Those conflicts come from a a whole variety of different directions as well. I mean, the time management, just dealing with the business elements of running a business, the marketing, dealing with sales and, 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 and then having to kind of fit in your own internal beliefs about some of those things and trying to reconcile that with being a, a creative person who expresses what they do through artwork. One of the core conflicts also is just the conflict between making money from something that's meaningful to you. Mm-hmm. I mean, this, the moment you decide to do that or you're, you've transitioned into that because maybe you enjoyed photography as a hobby and now you've transitioned into it being a profession. And for a lot of us, it's more of a transition than an overnight decision. It usually kind of, uh, you know, it's something we enjoy as a hobby. Everybody tells us we take pretty pictures and we decide to do more of it. And then we decide to make it our profession. So it tends to be for a lot of people a transition. But the transition that didn't take place was understanding that you've now gone from something that was doing something that was very meaningful to you that to something that you now want to make money on. And that in itself is a huge internal conflict for the creative person. That actually leads me into into another question, which is, what do you think is the big attractor for creative people that makes them jump into this business to begin with? I mean, they could just, if they're great at photography, why not just be satisfied being an amateur or having it as a hobby? Other than the money side of things, what do you think it is that makes people jump into this business? You know, I think it's it's an acknowledgement. You know, again, I don't know that, and I don't know that too many people jump into it, um, particularly nowadays. I, I don't imagine too many too many people wake up in the morning and think that being a photographer is the road to riches. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, maybe jump is too strong a word. Right, exactly. I mean, you know, if there was a time when maybe it was a you know, but nowadays it's not the easy way. I think it's the right way. And as I say, I don't know that you can. I don't know that you could stop the passion. Uh, I I had the good fortune of uh, last year being able to offer uh, a free personality test uh, by a fellow coach, a a friend of mine, Sally Hogshead, who has this incredible test called the Fascinate Test. And it yeah, it's fantastic. And Sally's a good friend. And so she allowed for her book launch, she allowed me to give the, her test or her assessment away. Uh, and the, it's based on, as you know, how how the world sees you and what the world finds fascinating about you. And so it, it offers the result of the assessment is it offers some triggers. And I was able to give away nearly 5,000 or over 3,000, some huge number of these tests. And she sent me the results, a summary of the results. And 95% of my audience that took that test has a trigger of passion. And it makes makes sense, right? Because that's what drives you. So I think I don't know that you could I don't know that you could hold it back uh, as far as wanting to become a professional. And I also believe people really want to be acknowledged. That's why we post things on Facebook and we look at the likes we get because we like to be acknowledged for what we put out there. You know, and that's being a photographer has that possibility. 
that we create things that people acknowledge that they like. The creative person as we are, we love to transform people. We love to know we played a role in making somebody happy uh, and making their day a better thing. We love to play a role in knowing that we're leaving something behind and that we've improved the world. So being a professional photographer offers all those opportunities. There's the other side of the coin too, where there's a gentle, sometimes not so gentle, pushing force where people who are creatives and have that true passion really feel very uncomfortable in what you might describe as a corporate environment. I mean, I, I worked in an office type environment for many, many years. I was a computer programmer and systems analyst and, and project manager working for banks and software houses and all that kind of thing. And I always felt some kind of in a discontent, if you like, for want of a better word, where I felt that there was something missing and that I wasn't doing really what I was really meant to do, or that there was some untapped things that I really needed to tap into but couldn't through the work I was doing, even though I really enjoyed what I did. I mean, I was a great programmer and I loved what I did, but I, I literally did jump out of that and straight into photography, you know, one day when things just got too much and I was like, okay, that's enough. But, you know, so there's that kind of sense of almost... It, it, a push away from having to conform or, or work in a corporate environment to the more sort of freedom, if you like, of being a creative person. I love that you've referred to it as a push because I, I've been looking at that a lot in my own personal journey. Is it a push or is it a pull? We also, as buzzwords, we hear a lot about finding our purpose. And I think more often than not, our purpose finds us and it pulls us. I coach a lot of, of people who, you know, were in the corporate setting and, and decide to become photographers. And they're actually some of my favorite clients because, first of all, they are, they're taking that big leap, which is really admirable. Uh, and I also love what happens because they, like one of my clients is a NASA scientist. I mean, really bright bright woman. And yet when she went into business for herself as a photographer, I remember she said to me once she felt like her entire left brain shut off. Like she's what I could do for as a NASA, what she could do for others, what she could do, you know, as a scientist was easy. And suddenly she's trying to run this small little photography business and it's it, she's paralyzed. And <laughs> I have to laugh because it, it's so true. That's so common. I mean, first of all, it's easier to do for others than it is for ourselves. But then in the corporate setting, she had been so accustomed to using her more logical side of the brain that now she's in business from a place of purpose and meaning and passion. And, you know, now there's this combination thing that you're working on the right and left side of the brain. But the cool thing is, is that this is something photographers do every day. You know, and the, the photography is both an art and a science. So I believe that every photographer can be an awesome business person. They don't think so often. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it becomes an excuse, you know, like, oh, I, I can't be good at business. And I, I say, you know, nonsense, because you already have the ability as a photographer to reason the left and right side of the brain because you do it every time you photograph. It's both a science and an art. So somebody just needs to help and support and, and guide them maybe to have that understanding and to use their more grounded logical sense to, to drive a better business. In probably 10, 15 years, I think we might see a shift in that kind of mindset about business. I mean, I, I grew up in the late 60s, early 70s, the last century, <laughs> no less. And, uh, you know, I guess we were brought up with different ideas and beliefs about business in those days. And I think nowadays, there's much more of an informal view of business, if, if that makes any sense, than there was back then. I think when the current sort of younger generation grow up, they may see the idea of going into a creative business as being a little bit different to how we see it. Absolutely. I mean, statistics will show, and there's there's been a, uh, a couple of articles written lately that by 2020, 40% of the American workforce will be freelancers. And by 2030, 60% of the American workforce will be freelancers, just like everyone listening to this program. And th so boy, if that isn't encouraging. And I think the reason for that is, is that society and, and socially, we are absolutely on a path where authenticity is your greatest branding message. You know, and I think the reason that comes about is people are choosing the relationships that are important to them today. And, and, and every way, I know there's challenges in the industry and there's challenges in the world, but I have to say, I am so much more optimistic about what lies ahead in our world than I ever imagined I could be. I love, absolutely love the way the world is transitioning because I, I believe we are transitioning into a society that really cares and is choosing relationships that are important to us. I, lo I love ATMs. 
I love ATMs because I really have no interest in having a relationship with a bank teller, <laughs> right? But I care deeply about service providers that I hire. People that are in my world close to me, I care deeply about having relationships with them. So as photographers, our clients are, ch they're choosing more than just, you know, somebody get a job done. They're choosing relationship. They're choosing relationship with you as their photographer. So I love the fact that, and, you know, and what makes them choose you is how authentic you are, whether your values align with them. That's why they choose you. That's why you have to have a standout statement to let the world know what you value and what you're all about, because so that you get chosen because they believe what you believe. One of the things that people say to me when, when we talk about this kind of thing with them is they say things, well, you know, I'm not that interesting or I don't really feel like I'm all that special or that I can't really create an essential message for me or a standout statement that is really all that amazing because I just don't feel like personally I'm that interesting to other people. How can people get over that? Well, first of all, it's just not true. You know, everyone is unique and has a unique contribution. You know, there actually was a TV show on many, many years ago um, that were these two guys, and that's how old the program was because it involves a telephone book. I mean, who even has a telephone book nowadays? <laughs> uh, but these two guys would travel across the country and stop at pay phones and open up a telephone book and just pick a random name out of that town. And they would show up in that person's door and ask them what the story of their life is. Nobody watched the show except me because I've never met anyone else that knows the show I'm talking about. It was on some bizarre channel. <laughs> you know, inevitably, every single person whose door they knocked on would say, well, I don't have a story. But they knew to ask the right questions. And ultimately, everybody has a story. Everybody has a story and everybody is unique. And, and the way I like to phrase it to my coaching clients is that you have to believe there's a tribe of people waiting for you to show up. Your job is to show up. That's the journey. That's the personal journey. But you have to believe there's a tribe of people waiting for you to show up. And when you do the work, you show up and you show up with a clear statement so that it's like your flag waving so people can find you, they show up. Are there any disadvantages to being 100% focused on the creativity of what we do while trying to launch or run a photography business. So in other words, it's a little bit like what Michael Gerber referred to in the E-Myth, you know, where he talks about the difference between it being a technician and focusing on the minutiae of what you do, as opposed to stepping back from that and focusing on the business side of things. I know a lot of photographers, when they start out, and me included, you know, when I started out, I was 100% focused on the images that I was producing. But as I learned, that the didn't really work out all that great <laughs> at the time. So what, what would you say if you could encapsulate them? What, what are the main disadvantages that, of being 100% creatively focused at the beginning? It's a terrific question because I want to be so blunt as to say, I don't think you'd be successful if you're 100% creatively focused. It depends on where your commitment comes from. And the reason I say I don't think you can be is because you have to I call it the, I talk about the conflicts we were saying before. I refer to this the heaven and earth conflict. Like as creatives, we are inherently of the heavens. Where we that's where we create, that's where we think. We tend to be ethereal, conceptual thinkers. It's terrific, and your creativity lies there, and you want to you want to make that thrive. If you're committed to petting, putting your best work out in the world, if you're committed, which I believe every you know every if you choose to go into the business of photography. What I want you to be committed to is creating a sustainable business for yourself that gets you out of getting by, but really, truly sustainable and fulfills your life. I want you to be committed to creating that so that you can keep giving your gifts. The saddest thing in the world to me is a creative person who gives up mm. because then you don't get to give out your gifts. So you're com it's not about a commitment to making money. It's not a commitment to making sales. It's being committed to creating something in your world that's going to sustain your livelihood, even give you abundance so that you can keep doing more of what you're really good at. So, you know, when you're committed to that, like I said, sales don't feel so creepy and a lot of the elements of business don't don't then feel so creepy because creepy you're committed to, you know, really putting your best work out there. So I don't think it's possible to stay fully creative. You have to bring those things down to earth. And if if you can't, although as I said, I believe most photographers have the ability to, to resolve that conflict very well on their own. If you can't, that's why you, uh, you know, maybe it's a, a partnership type of business, or maybe you, you know, you have a coach so to help you bring that things down to earth. Um, so you can collaborate with others to to help bring that down to earth. But in the end, you can only be successful in business if you create a, a grounded business for yourself.
Because after all, business as an entity has to survive on tangible things. You know, it doesn't live on fresh air. It needs money in, in order for it to prosper. I had an interesting email the other day from a photographer who said, I believe that everyone should be able to afford great photography. So that's why my prices are low. But in the next sentence, you know, she said, well, but how do I compete with folks on Craigslist offering photography for $100. Those, to me, seem like conflicting positions. And I think we have to make the decision that, you know, if the business is going to grow and if we're going to be here tomorrow to serve our clients, then we have to take care of the business. Whereas if, you, if you're charging super low prices and literally cutting your own throat, you're, you're essentially cutting off the life supply for your business, right? Yeah. And, and you're also absolutely, you can't sustain your life, which means you may have to give up. But even I'll say what I think is even more important is that you're actually not serving the world. You're not actually serving the people that you think you're serving by making it easy for them. When you take on the role of an entrepreneur or being in business, you're putting yourself, you know, as a leader, if mm. you will. And uh, as a leader, you have a, a responsibility, if you will, to serve, to serve others and to serve them in the way that they may not think they want to. If you're if you, anybody that's a parent knows is that when you have kids, it's your goal is not to be liked. I mean, that's a that's a nice to have. <laughs> your goal, right? Your goal is to to support them in the best way possible. So as a business person, I want my clients to like me, but my goal is not for them to like me. My goal is to serve them so unbelievably well that they just they can't imagine going and working with anybody else. So often, what makes what serves people best. And, and if you if you ask yourself the very same question, what serves you best, what serves people best is being stretched, right? So whatever I charge as a photographer and as a coach, it is not meant to be comfortable for anybody, right? Because it's and it's not about the money, but the money is such a trigger for causing people to stretch. And if my rates are beyond the level of comfortability for someone to hire me as a coach, that's where I want them to be. And the moment they become comfortable, I either change the rates or that may not be the right client for me because I want I want it to be uncomfortable. I want them to be so fully invested in the process of coaching that they show up 110% every single phone call. That's going to guarantee transformation for them. Right. And that's what I'm committed to. So as a photographer, it's not about giving your services away cheaply. It's what's a little uncomfortable for the people you want to serve, which just a little out of their comfort zone and help them and guide them to stepping up. You're, you're expanding them. Ultimately, that's what people are grateful for. And also, you want people to value what you do. Absolutely. And if you've ever made the comparison between giving something away for free from when you've charged, I mean, it's like night and day. People do not value what they get for free. There was actually a study done recently, a market research study, where this market research firm was calling people and giving them a free trip. And you, the number of excuses people would come up with to not accept the free trip were incredible. <laughs> well, thank you for this trip to the Bahamas, but I really don't have time. Or this is a bad week. I can't possibly take advantage of this $3,000 <laughs> free trip, right? So free is, free is hopeless. I mean, if free doesn't serve anyone. It really doesn't. Um, you know, it, it, that gets kind of a broad statement. Yes, there are opportunities for free. But if you're trying to create a sustainable business and, and really wanting to help elevate people to their highest being, then they have to stretch a little bit. The idea, too, I think, for people charging low prices for their photography comes from a lot of times, certainly in part anyway, the fear of being rejected by clients. I mean, you offer to do photography for somebody and you show them the price and they just flat out say no and you feel oh well it must be the price so if I keep the price low then more people will say yes and any kind of rejection is, is hard for it for a creative person like a photographer but how can photographers learn to separate their emotional attachment if you like from what they create from the more objective needs of making sales and, and taking care of the business Great question. I don't know that you can. You know, again, this is one of those conflicts between traditional business and and when you're in business marketing yourself and your talent, it is personal. You know, I mean, traditional business, don't take it personal, separate yourself from the, it's not possible when you are your brand, right? right? So I try to encourage people to not put a lot of energy towards that, but instead put your energy towards being resilient. 
Tiger Woods is, uh, has been studied, and I find him fascinating because they, it's uh, there's been studies to say that Tiger Woods, as the, the amazing golfer he is, is that part of the reason, or largely the reason he's successful, is not because he's the most amazing golfer, but he has an uncanny ability to bounce back from a bad hole. Mm. When he has a bad hole, he statistically has an unbelievable ability for the next hole to be great. And he's been questioned about this, and he said he has an internal practice, which his father taught him, to be resilient and bounce back recover. So what I suggest as a creative entrepreneur, when you're in business marketing yourself and your talent is to focus on how quickly you can bounce back because you're never not going to take it personal, nor should you, because it actually is what makes you good. And it's what makes you authentic, which is exactly what people want today. So, but, but have a process, like how quickly could you bounce back? Because you'll get knocked down time and time again, you're never going to make that go away, but you can figure out how to bounce back quicker. One way to put it would be focus on your attention through the windshield and stop looking in the review mirror. Love that. I've never heard that, but that's a good one. (laughs) You know, because what happened yesterday has no bearing on what's going to happen today or tomorrow or next week. And, you know, rejection is part of the game. (laughs) If some people are not rejecting you on the basis of your prices, you need to put the prices up. Absolutely. That's fantastic business coaching advice. That's exactly what I say, too, that there there has to, there should be a certain percentage of people who are having buyer's remorse or rejecting you on your price. That's how you know you're in the sweet spot. You know, if you don't want everybody rejecting you, because then you're too high. But if everybody's accepting you, then you're too low. So the sweet spot is knowing that you have a certain percentage of people who are having buyer's remorse and change in their order after the fact, or just flat out shocked. Again, but the shocked component is also another lesson in business is to do everything you can with your standout statement, with your your marketing promotion efforts, where you make your work visible, be targeted, you know, understand the avatar, understand your ideal client, who you can serve best, and do your very best to be visible only to them so that you don't have to deal with people who find their way in your world who aren't a fit because it's not comfortable for anybody. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Um, like I, we do a tremendous amount of marketing in my photography business through silent auctions. And we're successful with silent auctions because we take great care to only choose auctions where my perfect client is in attendance. When we do that, everything else rolls out perfectly well. We meet the right people, the right people who refer us to their right friends, who tell us about other right friends, who tell us about other right auctions. And it, it becomes a loop, a positive loop. We rarely have anyone in front of us who isn't a fit because I take great care to not put people in that uncomfortable position. So I, we don't get, I don't get a lot of rejection about prices, even though I'm really high end. Um, I don't get a lot of rejection because I make sure that I'm not putting myself in front of people that it would be uncomfortable. For. I have no, I, I try to live my life in a way of being non-judgmental. I don't live the life of my clients. You know, nor do I intend to. And I don't have an opinion about people that can't afford my services. I mean, they're, they're, everybody's living their own life to the best that they can. And I truly believe that. Um, but from a business perspective, I'm not interested in making people uncomfortable. That's a very interesting statement that you just made there about not having an opinion about the people who can't afford what you do. Because you know what I see on Facebook, especially all the time, photographers complaining in groups about the people who didn't hire them. They're wasting so much time and energy on getting upset and criticizing the people who didn't hire them when really they'd be better off redirecting that energy into focusing on the people who can. Yeah. And, you know, and just, um, I do, I think just overall, my value, one of the values that are important to me is I, I do live my life in a non judgmental way to the, the best that I can. And I think part of the reason that is, is that I serve as a photographer, I serve a very affluent clientele, but I came from nothing, right? So I've, walked all sides of the fence, mm-hmm. you know, so, um, you know, and I choose to live somewhere in between. Uh, and I'm fortunate that, uh, that I'm able to make that decision. But you know, I still have home to go to, you know, I still have, <laughs> you know, family. So, you know, I, I just I guess I just have respect for uh, all different price points. And what I think, you know, is your responsibility when you go into business is to be clear on who you're best to serve. Ironically, and I guess that's what it comes down to I, mean, I came from, you know, I would say lower middle class, I came from a very small town in upstate New York, uh, I had no relative understanding of what affluence meant or what money meant. I didn't have any I didn't you know, I said no relative form of it. I run for some reason. And I, as I matured, I got to understand the reasons, but I, I got the values of a much wealthier person. You know, even though it wasn't where I came from, I had values that were very different from where I came from, very different than my family, but perfectly aligned with wealthy people. And those values are related to photography very nicely because as a photographer, I just, I am one of my values. I just see, I see very long term. 
I see uh, the value of photography and what it means to leave something like that behind in the world and what it means to create family portraits. I have such a long term value for that. And yet I grew up in a lifestyle that, you know, worried about tomorrow. So my how I felt about photography related beautifully to a clientele who had the affordability to worry about tomorrow. And that's why I succeeded. I aligned myself with the values of the people that I was meant to serve. Like I said, I believe we all have a tribe that's waiting for us to show up. And unbeknownst to me, there was a tribe of people waiting for me in Connecticut. (laughs) <laughs> and, I, and I showed up and I showed up literally because I got lost on a highway. But that's how I showed up. <laughs> Very serendipitous, huh? Extremely. So I want to switch gears a little bit. We've got a few minutes left. So I've got a couple of other questions on slightly different areas of all of this. So the first one is to do with focus. And I know that you teach a lot about focus with your coaching clients. So I want to kind of investigate that a little bit. And a lot of the creative people that I know appear to have at least some tiny form of ADD where they find it a bit hard to keep focused on tasks and especially on things that they don't consider to be what you might call it, say, uh, you know, sexy, like taking photographs and messing with Photoshop and all that kind of stuff. Do you have any quick advice for people on maintaining the focus on the on the right things at the right time absolutely i have so much opinion on this you might get more than what you asked for (laughs) reason being is that this is this is such a big this is one of those big conflicts that i really try to help people get past because traditional business has it all wrong um and this is the thing that just really gets under my goat i think add is the new genius and i think You know, for a creative person, in fact, there's a quote all over my blog and I use it all the time, which says forcing focus blocks creativity. The problem is we're focusing on the wrong thing. We've been traditional businesses telling us to focus on doing one thing is telling us to focus on finding a niche all of which is contradictory to the natural way of being for the creative person. And yet we're told that we're only, we'll only be successful if we have a niche. We'll only be successful if we figure out how to stop chasing the squirrels. And it's just not true. You know, so, but we've been told that. So in doing this, and then we wind up, we go into business, we wind up not being happy. Your genius lies in your ability to create. Your genius lies in your ability to see everything around you. So it's not about focusing on what to do or finding a niche. What you want to focus on if there's anything to focus on is a deeper understanding of the direction that you're going in. And the direction you're going in is established based on your purpose, your why, what's most meaningful to you. So you you wind up having a focused direction with a lot of paths to get there. One of the metaphors I like to use is if you're climbing a mountain, you know, if you Mount Everest, you want to get to the top of it. Mm -hmm. If you focus on the top of that mountain, your, your logical way of getting there is straight up which is going to be really exhausting and impossible. The only way to actually get there, if to be a creator, is to consider all the possibilities, to meander around every obstacle and constantly choosing new paths and finding different paths appealing and enjoying the ride and the journey. Right? That That's the lifestyle of the creative person. That's what I refer to as the path of the creative warrior is that the freedom to do that. So it's as you can tell, it's something I'm most passionate about because it has just halted creatives from being able to be uh, successful in business and, and personally fulfilled is this idea that they can only focus on one thing to do. Uh, now, to qualify that, I will say that when going into business, it's possible that choosing an initial niche might be the quickest way to, to start, but guaranteed you cannot stay there very long, not in today's world, because you will be put out of business by a new technology or the guy next door or, you, you know, when's the last time any of us bought a CD? Right. I mean, the world is changing so quickly that a niche is just not a sustainable way of staying in business. It might be a way to start, but it's not a way to sustain a business nowadays. It's I I, I think the world of business has evolved into what I call diversifiers, which are people that are good at many things. It's not a generalist, a generalist, which is kind of halfway good at a lot of things. A diversifier is actually good at a lot of things. The difference is, is that I believe in the movement I follow, I lead, the movement I lead is I call it the new renaissance, uh, meaning it's a time in the future when creators will be the leaders and we will have the freedom to create in a variety of mediums just like they did in the Renaissance when they were painters and sculptors and scientists. Da Vinci was embraced and revered for using his left and right side of the brain. And we've evolved into that being a criticism instead. 
I seem to recall from my younger days when I used to read a lot of uh, science fiction novels and I was an avid reader of people like Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. And I remember Arthur C. Clarke had that same view of the future where the creatives would be the people in charge eventually. I agree. And, you know, as a podcast host myself, I've had speaker after speaker, guest after guest reinforce little bits you know, without my soliciting it, they, they say things that are right in that wheelhouse as proof that this is where it's going. And um, gosh, that's what could be more inspiring for our future. Just to sum up what you just said about all of that, because I, I don't want people to go away with different concepts of what we were talking about there. The idea is that it's okay to focus on different niches in photography. So as an example, let's say portraits, weddings, commercial, fine art, whatever they feel drawn to. But it's important to treat it as a diversification rather than being a generalist in the sense that, well, I I photograph kids and weddings and pets and commercial and I do fine art and all this just to get fingers in pies and hope that, you know, they come out with something good. I think it's even broader than that, to be honest with you, Nigel. I think what you want to focus on is what you want to stand for in the world, the difference that you want to make. And it can show up in a whole different bunch of different mediums. I mean, I and it's how I accomplish as much as I do in the course of a day as a podcast host, a photographer, an author, a business coach. I lead coaching programs. The reason I get so much done is because I it's a seamless move from one thing to another for me because it all is anchored on my core purpose, which I've done great a great deal of work to get clear on. You look at other companies like Zappos, I think is a fantastic fantastic example. Zappos, the online shoe company, I mean, they stand for ex- exceptional customer service. That's what they stand for. And they're expressing that by being an online shoe, shoe company. They express it by connecting with Amazon and, and ex- helping them support their business with excellent service. And they're also, there is talk that they will express that by going into the airline business. Wow. Because the CEO, Tony Shea, has said publicly that he thinks one of the industries that needs the most help with regards to customer service is the airline industry. Well, I don't think you'll find many people arguing with that one. Right. And, you know, look at a company like uh, Virgin Group is another one. Richard Branson leading Virgin Group. Mm-hmm. I mean, Virgin Group owns hotels hotels, uh, health clubs, beverage companies, airlines, cell phone company. I mean, it's it, the diversity is more than just the diversity within your chosen industry. It's actually choosing to be a multiple multitude of industries. And yet we all know what, we, what to expect. When we walk into the Virgin Airplane and the Virgin Hotel, they're going to feel remarkably similar because what I've not had the good fortune of asking Sir Richard Branson about this, but I would think that he what he wants to stand for in the world is just a little bit of fun and a little bit of rock and roll. I met him one time, actually, on one of his planes. He happened to be on the on this Virgin flight from Manchester, England to Boston. And I, I was joking with the check-in clerk, and I said, well, I don't suppose that Sir Richard is going to be on the flight. And, uh, and she said, uh, well, hang, hang on. She was tapping some keys, and she said, oh, yes, actually, he is. He's going to be oh, on, the, on the flight. And I was like, oh, that's so funny. Anyway, I thought she was kidding. Well, about halfway through the flight, there was this, you could, you know, you could tell there was some kind of noise going on behind where I was sitting. And we turned around, and sure enough, there he was. And he walked through the entire plane, and he spoke to every single person individually, not just to, you know, shake my hand, hey, thanks for flying. He spent time talking with people, asking them about their trip and and all that kind of thing. He was just wearing jeans and a sweater, you know, as he does, you know, Uh, totally genuine and authentic. And and he thanked everybody. At the end, he was by the door when we landed and he shook everyone's hand and thanked them for flying. And I think one of the things about him is he's kind of made the business world much more open to anybody who wants to go into it. And his whole sort of philosophy is based on, uh, if I can borrow a word from your statement, fearless exploration. Don't be scared. To, to go into something that is completely outside of your experience because you you can learn what you need to learn to do it. I think that's a great point. And yeah, I mean, that you're probably closer to understanding what he wants to stand for in the world than, than what I guessed at. You're right. He probably is about, you know, this fearless because he's a lot into exploration and mm-hmm. expansion. Um, but that's just it. I mean, I, I'll share, you know, more personally for me my core purpose is being a witness. Like what I've realized that shows up in my life as a repeated pattern is in some way or form, I change things by being a witness of it. Um, As a photographer, I was a witness to things for over 30 years and how I, what I saw through my lens. And and by the simple act of showing up and witnessing things transformed. Mm. And that's exactly what happens in my everyday and my coaching experiences. By my presence, 
I realize I'm able to people transform themselves. Um, I'm not doing the work, but they transform because I create the space for the transformation to take place. And that's that's the place. That's what I'm committed to. I'm committed to showing up in the world in as many places as possible where my what I take responsibility for as my my impact as a witness is that things will change. So I always jokingly say that maybe someday I'll open up a bed and breakfast if I can open it up as a witness and figure out how that wouldn't be creepy. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, you don't want the Bates Motel. Yeah, know. exactly. But I, I'm, ins- I'm inspired by where I can show up in the world in a way that by my presence and witnessing and, and laying eyes on, something happens for the benefit of other people. For someone who is a coach... I don't think that people can ask for anything better than that from you. To have somebody to facilitate and help them make that transformation without coming in with essentially a hammer and chisel and trying to mold them into something that the coach thinks they should be. Exactly. I agree with you. Well, Jeffrey, thank you so much for this. This has been wonderful. I I could literally sit here for quite a lot longer and investigate some of these ideas with you in a lot more detail. Uh, But sadly, we're kind of out of time. But uh, hopefully, maybe sometime we'll get you back on and we can talk about some of this in, in a bit more detail. But if people want to find out more about what it is that you do and who you are and all that kind of thing and investigate, you know, looking at your coaching services, where can they get in touch with you? What's the best way for them to find you? Fantastic. Well, thank you for that. Well, the first thing I'd like to offer everyone is I, I'm just completing a, an ebook that I think will be particularly valuable for the audience of photographers because it is literally called the essential business model for photographers. And uh, this is this this is the real stuff. This is not the business model you take to the bank with a bunch of figures. These are the eight essential elements that you need to have a well-rounded, successful business. So that's a brand new ebook coming out, and they can grab that at eightessentialelements.com. Is that the number eight or the word eight? It's the word eight. Yeah, eight essential elements spelled out. And uh, so that's certainly that's you know that's I'm offering that for free. So anybody can go get that. Eightessentialelements.com will get you this this e-guide of the essential elements for the business model for photographers. And then in addition to that would be my blog is probably, which is blog.jeffreyshaw.com. Another great resource. It's where my podcast resides. It's where anything going on in my world. Uh, I have a lot of other free e-guides there, uh, suggested book lists, like anything I can give out to the world resides at blog.jeffreyshaw.com. Fantastic. I'll make sure that those are in the show notes as well for people. Terrific. And thank you for your time. And I'll absolutely come back. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nigel. Редактор